So here's a case of a maxillary molar, and we're going to show you a pulpectomy, a quick pulpectomy, and then looking for MB2, obviously. Um, so this tooth is still vital, and what I'm going to do is it's got a large composite restoration. This actually fractures right in the composite, interesting enough. So I'm using a number four long surgical burr in a high-speed handpiece. And in this situation, um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to be drawing a line from the palatal cusp to the mesial buccal cusp. And I'm just drawing back and forth and back and forth. So in these cases, what I'm going to do is for my anesthesia, which is really important, um, I found this has made an incredible difference, is doing a, a posterior superior alveolar block, a regular infiltration, a bit of a palatal, and then I'll go back and finish. Um, that usually takes up two and a half carps. And I'll finish with um, the rest of the, the, the infiltration at the mesial buccal, sort of just infiltration around this tooth. And that gives me incredible anesthesia. So after we do that round burr, I'm just looking to see if I perforate it into the pulp chamber anywhere, and it looks that I have. So if you haven't used this burr, this burr is incredible. It's called the endo-Z burr, but essentially it's a non-cutting, non-end cutting tip burr. And you place that in the, onto the pulpal floor once you perforate it into the pulp chamber, and you just let that, like a roller coaster, roll along the, roll along the, um, a bubble floor, it's absolutely incredible. You have to kind of practice on extracted teeth just to get the feel of doing it blind because there's not much you can see. What I'm doing here is I'm just, I'm creating a stable reference point. I've found that this will shave off, I'd say 5% of your, 5% um, of your time doing endo and it'll probably decrease your frustration by maybe 30% because I'll get a stable flat reference point to make my endo just so much more efficient. And this tooth is gonna be getting uh, some sort of direct or indirect cuspal coverage restoration. So here you can see, now we're in after we've removed most of the ceiling, the, the roof of the pulp chamber. And you can see it was a vital case. I'm gonna open this up a little more with my endo zebra. You know, an access is really a dynamic process. And what I have learned is that if I can't get proper access into one of my canals with my rotary instrumentations, then I will bring out the endo zebra even halfway through the procedure and open it up. Cause I'll tell you that five seconds of using this burr saves me probably about 10, 15 minutes in frustration. And what I'm doing here is actually, I read in an article a long time ago from David Clark and John Academy. I'm talking about kind of minimalist dentistry uh, access openings. This is not ninja style. Um, I don't want to really get into that. We're talking about like predictable cases, but what I'm doing here is I'm placing this little thing, this little bevel. And what this can do is actually increases the light coming into the case. And it actually increase, it makes your file, it gives your, your files able to, to come around this bend a little bit easier instead of a straight ledge. I don't do this all the time. It's kind of, if I'm, uh, thinking about it, I'm like, Oh, I'll just do that. So let's take a look at what we got here. Uh, we're gonna zoom in right here. All right, so here you can see the crack through the restoration, which I never, I rarely see this in composite. Um, looks like we had a bit of leakage. You can see, um, then we have our fracture line going down into, uh, down into where the orifice area is. Now this tooth did not have any probing depths and it's still vital. So I think there's a really good, according to the literature, we still get a good prognosis as long as we get this uh, covered with a uh, indirect restoration. <clears throat> so here's, this is a mesial buccal cusp. This is the MB1 canal. MB2 is roughly around here. And we really need to get rid of this. If you try to put a file in here, it's just gonna go horizontal and hit, hit the side of the tooth. Uh, here's a pedal canal, and then there's a distal buccal right around here. So my experience and what I've I've done and I've been trained actually by others is to what we're going to do is we're going to clean and shape the main canals if not clean and shape them completely I'm going to remove the coronal two-thirds of the pulp tissue and then get sodium epichlorate down there full strength because we really want to degrade all that tissue as much as possible to ensure the you know to try to get the best outcome of a case because that's what we're trying to do we're not trying to like you know, it's one thing to make your endos super skinny and amazing, but then you leave a whole bunch of 
vital tissue behind and it fails. So it, you got to go back and retreat it. So the reason why I'm saying that is because, you know, Facebook and Instagram are ripe full of amazing clinicians, but you know, they've been doing this for 20 years and they know how this instrumentation works. So it's important to make sure you get proper irrigation that, you know, our files only allow us to get irrigation and remove debris. The irrigation is really what's going to uh, make this work. So this is full strength hypochlorite, We're rinsing that out. So now I've got hypochlorite down into at least the corona two thirds of those canals. And then what I'm going to do is, I guess in this case, what I elected to do was just look for MB2. Um, so I'm using a Mueller burr and I do that in another video. I actually had to review this a few times and I don't know why I'm doing this, but I think what happened was my dental assistant had the Mueller burrs out and I was like, oh, okay, sure. I'll try them. And again, it's like, ah, it's just not working. <clears throat> so I tried it again and they're just too flexy. You can see them flexing there. And I, but what you need to do, if you want to take this seriously, you can see it flexing there like a golf club. Oh, that's why. And I broke it. So that's, <laughs> so that's why I don't like these things. And they're supposed to break like that too. So that's why I was lucky enough to then get my Munzburr out. So, you know, you really need to practice on extracted teeth. I can't really emphasize that enough, really to maximize your efficiency, your chair time, your chair time. Um, economics is to really do this on your own time. Practice, practice, practice. All right, so we're getting the other month's burr out. You can see it's taken us a few minutes. Look at the amount of time I'm wasting by getting that burr out. So that <clears throat> note to self, make sure all your stuff is set up properly before you go, before you get started. So here we are removing. So now you can see a little more hemorrhage tissue. So that tells me we're getting potentially getting close. I don't think we're getting close to the, uh, it could also say we're perforating, but I don't think so. We got, look how much, look how thick we've got between the, you know, I'd say between here and here. For this is where the root would be, not here. So literally, I'm just going, uh, it appears to be haphazard, but it's actually not. I'm slowly making my way from a line between the mesial buccal uh, canal, MB1, to the palatal canal. And let's take a look what we got. So we're going to keep going. And what my dental assistant is doing at this point is, so this is a really good, in the really good thing here, like if, you can get your dental assistant to, oh, we're going off the screen here, get your dental assistant to blow air and make sure this is dry. Then the, the dust, dust, the dentin dust is just going to go flying away. If you keep it a bit wet, it actually makes it a little more frustrating. You can't really see what's going on. All right, so we've opened this up. Let's take a look at what we got. So that's down the distal buckle, getting our working legs. So we're getting our working lengths of all our canals, our main ones. Getting our glide path established pretty quick. And we've got a little bit of hemorrhage from the remaining pulp tissue in there. All right, let's take a look at... All right, so we're going to clean and shape. As you can tell, I haven't watched this for about a year, so I'm trying to figure out what I'm doing here. So I'm getting my working length. I'm cleaning, going, cleaning and shaping to working length on my main canals. And then we're going to come back and tackle MB2. There we go. Sorry about that. All right, so we've, now we've got hypochlorite down those canals and it's sit and it's going to degrade that tissue. Now we're looking for MB2, which likely is around this area here. Let's take a look and see where the file goes. So it can be anywhere along this line. You see this little groove here. It can be in there. It can be beside it. We take a six file and we're gonna fish around for see where we can get it. So what I'll do is I'll place a really significant curve just to be able to get straight line access. 
I mean, ideally what you could have done is remove some more of that composite restoration because this is really holding it up and I'm not really doing anything to negatively impact the restorability of this tooth by removing this restoration. So that's what I probably would have done in looking at this. So I can't get much of a snag. So what I'm going to do with that file, I'm going to remove, I'm going to trough a little more, trough a little more mesial and a little more apically. And again, you're kind of wondering like, how far can you go? And the real question is, um, at this stage of the game, how comfortable you are with what you're doing. And that's why, again, extracting uh, extracted teeth serve a great purpose because then you, you know, we're this far into the case uh, and you want to make sure we're going to get success with it. And it's just taking that time. It's a time. So there's a stick right there. So this is... This is what my experience has been common for MB2. It's not the one where I see on the internet where the case is like looking at you in the face. You're like, oh, there it is. It's like you go searching for it. You have to have the confidence to remove that white um, dentin. I find that that took me a really long time. I can't tell you how many cases before I felt confident removing that. And let's find where that stick is. So again, this is the problem with max molars. There might there will be a point where you're kind of like, oh, I give up. So this is the next this is the next level of kind of like, okay, well, I've had enough. I can't get that file in there. I'm going to see if my wave on gold can make its way down there. And because with a six file, it kind of it becomes tedious, it's really flexible. You can see this is, uh, you know, this is fiddling around with MB2s. Ideally, what you could do, arguably, like a, a real expert would say, get rid of this. Here, you know, look at what the space I'm working in. It's not that useful. My file's coming out this angle. So I let go of the file there to see if it's kind of stuck in the canal, and it looks like it is. There we go. So we're getting the pull. So what I did there with the Wave 1 Gold, and again, I'm watching this for the first time again, is I opened up the orifice just a hair. And arguably, you could remove more of this. Again, even more with the round burr, just to get a little bit further down. Further mesial, further apically. Uh, I'll use the Wave 1 Gold not to try to go all the way down in this case, but just to kind of open up the orifice so I can get a snag with the, uh, with the, six, with the 6 file. So we're watch whining, watch whining, watch whining. So you can see it right there. So you've watched the whole process of it getting down there. So there we go. So you can see that's where it was. And you know what, honestly, because there's a fracture here, um, you know, the pulp seems to calcify more. So this one would have been calcified more. And that's actually one of the things I will look for. If there's a fracture anywhere in this along the mesial ridge, it's going to make looking for MB2 a little more complicated. So there's the file there. I'm really impressed with that shot. It's really tough to get some of these video images. So I'm gonna go with the 6810 uh, series of filing. So I'm gonna watch line pull, watch line pull. And you know, essentially, once I get down to working length, get a glide path set, I might, we'll see what I do in this case, whether I use the wave angle glider or I just use a 10 file. After the 10 file, I mean. So we're gonna open that up, watch wine, watch wine pull, watch wine pull, watch wine pull. And my experience has been, you know, the MB2 typically seems to wanna to go towards the MB1. Kind of in that direction. So in taking my hand file down to length if I feel and it's kind of a really touchy subject <laughs> disregard the pun that if say for example between 16 millimeters here and where the stopper is if it almost freely drops it gives me a good sense that they're probably joined those two canals you can't you can't use the uh, it's really I've been burned by using the uh, one canal drains by 
aspirating uh, irrigant from one of the other canals, meaning I'll use, I'll suction it out from the MB1 canal and see if it leaves, evacuates the MB2. Um, I've been burned by that, so I don't think that's a really trustworthy uh, technique. So here, this is the technique you don't want to use, but it's really useful to be able to watch because you can see what's going on. I have no irrigant in the chamber when I'm <laughs> using my wave on gold. And that honestly speaks to kind of the resistance to fatigue on this file just because of that re reciprocating motion. So I've got a little bit of irrigant in the, in the, in the uh, pulp chamber. And we're just making our way south. Or north, I guess. It's a max ray tooth. And that's pretty much it for, let's take a look. I think our cleaning shaping is done for that canal. Irrigate lots. So I still do it. Okay, well, I just disregarded what I said. So I still do the check to see whether or not irrigant comes up and down the canal. But that can be, you can be faked out by an isthmus really easy, especially in a necrotic tooth. Uh, because if the isthmus is, you know, empty, void of vital tissue, they can join and you'll... I've cleaned and shaped one and then I found out there were two, like two separate portals of exit. Uh, so you have to be very careful with that. All right, so that's cleaning and shaping MB2.